Hi, everybody. It is Dr. F. Gray Wilson here, and um, I'm going to talk to you today about something important to a lot of us uh, based on a new study that has just come out that promises to tell us the right way to exercise. Um, this is a major issue um, as we think about the best ways to sort of stay healthy. Uh, let me put myself up in the corner here. Um, there are basically two main types of exercise that exercise physiologists think about. There's there's aerobic exercises, these sort of cardiovascular things like um, like like running on a treadmill or running outside, um, that kind of stuff. And then there's muscle strengthening exercises, lifting weights, calisthenics, and so on. And of course, there are plenty of exercises that do both at the same time. But it feels to me like the the era of aerobic exercise as the main way to improve health was sort of the 80s and early 90s and then there started to be increasing recognition that muscle strengthening exercise was really important too so we've got a ton of data on the uh, benefits of cardiovascular exercise aerobic exercise so there's you know a decreased risk of cardiovascular disease decreased risk of cancer decreased risk of all cause mortality even improved cognitive function um across a variety of study designs including cohort studies but also some randomized controlled trials where people were randomized to aerobic activity and we're starting to get more data on the benefits of muscle strengthening exercises although i don't think i just think there's not it hasn't been in the in the zeitgeist as much um so we know obviously it increases strength, may decrease visceral fat, um, increase anaerobic capacity, increase muscle mass, and therefore basal metabolic rate. Something I think is really interesting about muscle strengthening is that muscle just takes up more energy at rest. And so maybe building bigger muscles increases your basal energy expenditure, which can be very good, and increased insulin sensitivity because muscle is a good insulin sensitizer. Um, but, you know, do you do both? Do you do one? Do you do others? What's the right answer here? So depends on who you ask. Uh, the CDC current recommendations, these change from time to time, is that you should do at least 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity aerobic activities. Anything that gets your heart beating faster counts here. So that's 30 minutes, five days a week. Um, you'll note that they also say you can do 75 minutes a week of vigorous intensity aerobic activity. Vigorous intensity is something that really gets your heart rate up where you're really breaking a sweat. So they push on that. And then they also now say they recommend at least two days a week of a muscle strengthening activity, activities that make your muscles work harder than usual, whether that's, you know, just push-ups or lifting weights or something like that. The WHO is similar, but a little bit different. You'll note that they aren't targeting 150 minutes a week. They actually say at least 150 to up to 300 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity um, or 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous intensity aerobic physical activity. So they're actually pushing the they're, they're sort of setting the floor there where the W where the CDC sets um, its target and then goes a bit higher. They also say two days of muscle strengthening per week for optimal health. But what you know, what is the data show us? Why am I talking about this this week? Um, and it's because of this. We've got a new study out in JAM Internal Medicine uh, by Ruben Lopez Bueno and colleagues entitled Prospective Associations of Different Combinations of Aerobic and Muscle Strengthening Activity with All-Cause Cardiovascular and Cancer Mortality. I'm going to focus on just all-cause mortality um, for, for brevity, but the, the results that we'll discuss are broadly similar. So let's talk about the data source for just a moment. This is uh, data from the U.S. National Health interview survey. So a lot of people, 500,705 individuals take part in the survey, answering a slew of questions, including self reports on their exercise amounts um, and of a pretty long follow up, a median follow up of about 10 years looking for things like deaths, cardiovascular cancer deaths, cardiovascular deaths and so on. So the survey classified people into a bunch of different exercise categories here. So there are uh, how much time people spent doing moderate physical activity, how much time doing vigorous physical activity, and how much time doing muscle strengthening activity. And so you can see there are six categories based on time of moderate physical activity. I'm highlighting in green the uh, WHO targets. 
uh, four categories in time of vigorous physical activity. Again, in green, the WHO targets, and then two uh, categories of muscle strengthening, either greater than or less than, uh, greater than or equal to, or less than two times per week. So we've got six categories of moderate times four of vigorous times two of muscle strengthening gives us 48 possible combinations of exercise you could do in a typical week. And then we can just say, okay, so like, what's the best? Okay. So here I am just showing you the, um, the, the categories, the percentage of people that fall into each of these 48 potential categories. And so far and away, what you can see here is that the largest is that 35% of people fall into the nothing category, no moderate activity, no vigorous activity, and less than two sessions per week of muscle, muscle strengthening activity. That is a bit of a problem, I, I, I would argue, in the United States, this type of sedentary behavior. And then you can see kind of a smattering of, of distribution around that. But this is this number, the nothing people, is going to be uh, our reference category moving forward. Um, so who are these people? A uh, bit of data I pulled out here from table one in this paper. Um, what you see here on the far left are people who basically do, uh, who don't hit the targets. The vast majority of people in the study, in fact, who who don't hit that 150 minute a week uh, of moderate or 75 minutes a week of vigorous, and they don't do two days a week of muscle strengthening activities. So you've got 361,000 people in this category. And then these three categories are sort of increasing amounts of um uh, of, of exercise. Um, and so what you can see is that, you know, younger people seem to be doing more exercise at the higher ends. You know, men are more likely to be doing higher end exercise. Some interesting findings from the alcohol drinking survey. In fact, right. You see, um, that the, the people who do more exercise are more likely to be current drinkers by their definition. Um, this is interesting. I confirm this data and, um, uh, with the, with the investigator and, you know, it might, suggest one of the reasons why some studies sometimes show that drinkers have, you know, better outcomes um, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, either cardiovascular or cognitive outcomes over time. There's a lot of conflicting data there, but in part, it, it might be that kind of healthier people might drink more alcohol. Um, that could be a socioeconomic phenomenon as well. Now, of course, what blew my mind were these smoker numbers. Don't get too excited about it. What it looks like from the table in JAM Internal Medicine is that 20% of the people who don't do much exercise smoke and then something like 60% of the people who do more exercise smoke. That can't be right. So I did check in there with uh with the lead author and I can I you know this is this is why I'm here, right? So um uh, a little bit of peer review after the fact. There is a mistake in these columns for smoking. So they, they were supposed to flip the never smoker and current smoker numbers here. So you can actually see that just 15.2% of those who exercise a lot are current smokers, not 63.8%. Uh, apparently, this is going to be fixed uh, online. But just in case you saw this and you were as confused as I was that these like incredibly healthy smokers are, are out there exercising all the time, it's, it's just a, a typo. Now there's bias here, obviously. One of the big ones is called reverse causation bias. So this is what might happen if, let's say you're already sick, right? You have cancer, you have some serious cardiovascular disease, heart failure, so you can't exercise that much. You're, you physically can't do it. And then if we find that you you know, die thereafter, uh, well, really, we weren't seeing that exercise is beneficial. We're seeing that sicker people aren't as able to exercise. So they got around this a bit by excluding mortality events within two years of the initial survey. So so no one could die. Anyone who died within two years after saying how often they exercised um, uh, was not included in this analysis. So that at least goes somewhere to saying like, OK, they you know, we weren't asking people who had like metastatic cancer or something and were really having trouble Um it doesn't mean they were perfectly healthy. And, and of course, that um, is, is known as like the healthy exerciser effect or the healthy user effect sometimes. Um, this means that, you know, people who exercise a lot probably do other healthy things that, you know, they might eat better. They, um, they, they might just get out in the sun more. Maybe they take vitamins or supplements that uh, are either helpful or not helpful. Who knows? Um, they try to get around this just through multivariable adjustment. You can see they adjust for age, sex, race, marital status, et cetera here. Uh, no adjustment is perfect. There's always residual confounding. Um, uh, but you know, this is probably the best you can do with a data set, uh, like the one they have access to.
All right, so let's go to the results. Um, these results are, are nicely heat mapped in the paper. They're divided by uh, people who have less than two days of muscle strengthening activity versus more than two days of muscle strengthening activity. And our reference groups here that we want to pay attention to are that the people who don't do anything. So the highest mortality of um, 9.8 individuals per thousand person years is seen in the group that reported no moderate physical activity, no vigorous physical activity, and less than two days a week of muscle strengthening activity. Um, and what you can see is as you move kind of up and to the right, so more vigorous physical activity, more moderate physical activity, um, you get lower numbers. Um, the lowest number I found here was 4.9. These were people that got greater than 150 minutes of, per week of, visit, of vigorous physical activity. Um, they actually didn't get that much moderate physical activity, maybe because they were too busy doing all that vigorous physical activity. And of course, two days of muscle strengthening activity. Now, we don't want to get too into the weeds of comparing, you know, 4.9 to 5.2 to 5.5. The authors only compare these boxes to the reference box, which is that, you know, no physical activity box using statistical tests. Um, and and the, the numbers in each of these boxes are sometimes quite small. And so we don't want to make overly large generalizations, but I will make some generalizations, which is to me looking at this data, the benefit, the bang for your buck of vigorous physical activity seems to be quite a bit more than the bang for your buck of moderate physical activity. So pushing on the vis vigorous physical activity. The other thing I want to point out is let's hop from the same place in a less than two months, less than two days a week of muscle strengthening activity to more than or equal to two days a week of muscle strengthening activity. So I just picked two arbitrary boxes, but what you can see here is that given the same amount of vigorous and moderate physical activity, getting those two days of muscle strengthening in activity does have a tendency to reduce the overall mortality. And this is not necessarily causal, um, but it is rather potent and consistent across all the different groups. So, you know, what are we supposed to do here, right? Well, I think the the most clear thing from your the study is 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 the not nothing. You you know, no physical activity is not good for you. Anything is better than nothing. You really don't want to be in that zero 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 group um, when it comes to that. You know, I think this study does suggest that if you are going to get activity pushing on the vigorous activity, if you're able, if you're physically able to do it, may be somewhat beneficial. Um, and of course, layering in the mu muscle strengthening activity as well seems to um, be associated with some amount of benefit. So, you know, perhaps like everything in life, there's no one simple solution. It's a mixture. Um, but I think, uh, you know, telling ourselves, telling our patients to, yep, get out there if you can, you know, ride a bike, jog, et cetera, break a sweat, you know, as often as you can during the week. And take a couple of days to get those muscles a little stronger, get those muscles a little bigger, maybe increase your insulin sensitivity, maybe increase your basal mo metabolic rate. Um, you know, is it guaranteed to extend life? No, this is an observational study. We can't say uh, we don't have causal data here, but it's unlikely to cause much harm. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm particularly happy that people are doing a much better job now of really dissecting out the kinds of physical activity that are beneficial. And it turns out that, you know, all of it is, and probably a mixture of all of it is best. So thanks, and I'll see you next time.